good night to those who've joined in. I'm, I'm glad to have a, another time of discussion and uh, looking at some things related to uh, culture and society and morality and ethics and and uh, specifically the Christian perspective, um, but also just some general reason that that is it's not as though uh, you know <clears throat> it's not as though you have to have a Bible verse to understand how to be reasonable. And so I do want to uh, to bring out some things uh, tonight concerning um, the pro-choice, pro-life debate, and um, and why it shouldn't be a debate. Um, why we made a grave and fundamental error in 1973 when this uh, Roe versus Wade uh, came out on the on the favoring side of uh, um, of abortion. And the choice that was that was allotted there um, to to a person to do something to another autonomous person. Um, good night to the Pearsalls and to the Shillings. As usual, let me know when you check in, and uh, I will. Uh, and and also as usual, as I always try to respond. If you have a comment, especially you know if you're listening, maybe you disagree. Maybe there's something that I say that's, uh, you know, uh, something you feel is is poor reasoning or whatever. Um, I'm I'm open to hear what that is, and um, you know I understand that lengthy text responses in the midst of a conversation like this are difficult. <clears throat> but even if you have to craft uh, something and you post it after the fact, I will uh, do my best to respond to it after the fact. Uh, so it's it's, uh, it's good to be with everybody tonight. Love you too, Miranda, and uh, good to see the Colleen is here. I want to start with this thought. I was listening to the other day. I was listening to a theologian, and his name is Douglas Wilson. Um, he is uh, he's he's actually he's pretty well known, uh, modern, lives right now, and he has a blog and everything. And but I was listening to an interview that he was having with somebody else, and he spoke about something that I thought was really interesting, and I really liked it. And it was this idea of having a priori no problem passages. Um, basically, he, he said that his his father, when he was younger, and I thought, wow, what an awesome father uh, that would be intentionally teaching these kinds of things to his son to get him to think rationally and everything else. But his, his dad told him he kind of needed to have on hand um, some passages uh, related to culture and morality and ethics and all of that that uh, are are no problem passages once you know once the exegesis is done and once you're aware of what the bible is saying and once you see clearly you know it's this is not just you're not reading into the bible your own thoughts but you're actually thinking god's thoughts after him as we uh, who are made in the image of god are supposed to be doing um and so you've done your exegesis work you've done your proper study you know this is what it's saying. And also you have sort of the groundwork and the basis of, of a, a worldview that says that this book is, um, is inerrant. It's infallible. Um, it's, it is fully sufficient for life and godliness. And I believe that is the case. And uh, several months ago, back at the, toward the beginning of coronavirus, I actually did a series on how we can be confident that the book that we have is uh, accurately preserved and how it, the testimony that it gives is accurate. So there's a lot of reasons behind um, why I would hold up this book in that way. But once you've done the study and and in your conscience and in your mind, you know on a on a given cultural issue or whatever, you know, okay, that's what it's saying. Then it has to become a a no problem passage for you. In that, um, you know, in, in the face of adversity. There is no flight. There's no. There's no running from it. Simply because there's pushback. There is no. Let me go re-examine. To um, uh, you know, in because that happens a lot of times. People will come to a consensus, or they'll come to a, a conclusion about something, and they'll have a strong hold on it until there's some emotional event that happens in their life that would challenge maybe their perspective because they don't really like what it's going to mean for their life if they hold on to the perspective they had at the beginning. And so then all of a sudden, hey, well, God God 
you know, realigned me and, and told me that my perspective of the plain words of the Bible was actually wrong all along. That kind of thing happens all the time. And uh, it's it's really sad. And it's um, and so anyways, Douglas Wilson's father was saying you need to have these a priori, no problem passages that are just understood and uh, and accepted. And the issue of uh, the pro-life position, um, which is uh, which is thoroughly rooted in uh, in not only the Bible, but the Bible is going to be fundamental. I, I am going to actually say some things about the scientific aspect of it tonight, but the pro life issue is thoroughly, entirely connected to uh, the ideas of love your neighbor as yourself and uh, a number of scriptural principles. That if you are a Christian, you cannot deny them. And I. Uh, it's amazing that you even have to that that's that that's somehow a bold statement to make but I will make it again you cannot be a christian and reject the pro life position on uh roe versus wade and the abortion issue and i'm going to bring out some things in that regard tonight beginning with the bible which is supreme because it is the authoritative god breathed uh, word. It is the word from the creator of the universe, and he maintains all authority. We are the potter. He is the clay. He decides uh, and determines what is right. And we, um, uh, fortunately, uh, because of the revelation that he's given us, and even because of the conscience that he's written on our hearts, we're able to uh, to arrive at proper understanding of these kinds of things. Having said that, let me start with a couple of scriptures that have really informed my thinking on the the pro life issue. Um, <clears throat> I'm actually going to pair. I want to I want to start by pairing a brief word from David in Psalm 139 with a brief word from Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter one. Um, so let me just read these two things together. I'll, I'll read the first part from David and then the next part from Jeremiah and. I just want you to see the the grammatical connection between the two and how one of them kind of um, exposes something in the other. But David says, uh, he's praying to God, and he says, your eyes saw my unformed substance. And in a minute, I'm going to read uh, a, a bigger section of Psalm 139 that gives the context of this, but this is in the womb. When he's inside his mama's tummy, he says, your eyes saw my unformed substance. And then, so that was David praying to God. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. And then Jeremiah says, excuse me, God says to Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. So the connection I hope that you heard was formed versus unformed. So David says, you saw my unformed substance. And then God said to Jeremiah, before I formed you, I knew you. So back when he wasn't formed yet, back when he was just a zygote or whatever. And God speaking to Jeremiah says, before I formed you, I knew you. So the creator of the universe is looking into this uh, this woman's tummy and this totally unformed um, life is in there, a zygote or whatever stage it was. And God knew Jeremiah there because it was a life and God was in the process of making it. In fact, the idea of God being the one who does the uh, the making, you know, is it's it's implied in what God says. I, be, you know, it's actually not just implied; it's direct with what He says to Jeremiah. I formed you before I formed you. So God is saying, "I'm the one that's doing that." So one of the first things that that from a Christian standpoint you have to um, you have to come to terms with is that the creation of a human life is a work of the hands of God. How do the cells know how to align themselves? How does the DNA from both uh, the man and the woman 
come together and know how to form itself and string it itself together in such a um, such an amazingly designed way and to form blood vessels and layers of skin and a beating heart and you know neurons in the brain and, and all of it firing together. Um, it is a work of God. In fact, I've heard more than one OBGYN specifically say, you know, a, a baby is a, it's a miracle because, um, you know, the men and women do very little by way of active uh, making of this. Um, I think we all know what goes into that. And, and then just nine months later, uh, this fully formed, amazing new human is in the world that beforehand wasn't there and had never existed before. Um, it's astounding. But Jeremiah, God says, I formed you. And in Psalm 139, David says, you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance, and in your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. So there's a couple things. God is the one making it, and, and David pulls this out. He says, it was you. You formed me, you saw me, you knew me, and you even had, you know, this plan for my life. Um, you knew all of the days that I would have before any of them had even happened. So God is not only actively working and making the human, but God is developing plans and, um, you know, things that he desires for that human in his or her life. Uh, which, which from a Christian standpoint, you cannot get around what the Bible is saying about this. Life begins before there's any formation of a human in, in a human shape, as we might call it. Life begins before that point when it uses the word as when they were just an unformed substance. God was the one who was involved in the entirety of the process. God is the one who is doing it. So if you disrupt that from the Christian standpoint, you are disrupting the very work of God as he's making new life. I, I would not want to stand before the creator having had a perspective that thought that was okay to do that. Now, I want to um, read a couple things because while in 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 my understanding of the world, there's a creator of the universe. Uh, his name is Yahweh, Jehovah. He rescued the Jews from slavery in Egypt, uh, created a nation. Within that nation, there was, through a long series of events, a Messiah who, uh, who's, who was promised to come, and he did come, and his name was Jesus, and he came to die for the sins of the world. He came so that you and I could have salvation, so that those who in the past have had abortions can have salvation and can have grace uh, for that sin, and so that um, anybody who's done anything can have salvation. And this God has spoken into the world through his apostles and his prophets and through chiefly his son Jesus, and we have this book that's a record of the things that he said. Chiefly, this is chief. God is supreme, and nature and science are subordinate in that they are the created things. God is the uncaused thing, and nature and science are subordinate. That's why I started by pointing out what the Bible says. And then as a subordinate point, I'm going to go to something that we understand um, scientifically about this issue. But <clears throat> um, listen, let me read to you. This was, uh, this was before a, a governmental – so there was, there was a meeting that was had to kind of get to the bottom of a scientific consensus. And a number of scientists were present to just give their unbiased opinions about the question, when does human life begin? Um, Alfred Bongianani, he's a professor of pediatrics and obstetrics at the University of Pennsylvania – he said, I've learned from my earliest medical education that human life begins at the time of conception. I submit that human life is present through this entire sequence from conception to adulthood. 
and that any interruption at any point throughout this time constitutes a termination of life. And I think it's also worth noting that as I'm reading these persons and their their unbiased scientific perspective, they are not um, coming there to argue for a pro-choice or pro-life position. In fact, I think a lot of them were pro-choice, uh, I, oddly enough. But they are giving just the base scientific facts of the matter. Uh, Dr. Jerome Lejeune, who's a professor of genetics in Paris, he said, after fertilization has taken place, a new human being has come into being. Then he said, this is no longer a matter of taste or opinion, not a metaphysical contention. It is plain experimental evidence. So unbiased scientists are looking and, and they're saying, look, you can't pinpoint any other point in the process from fertilization to the time where the baby's born. You, there's no other point where you could say that's the point where life began, but it wasn't before that. The plain truth of the matter is that it happens at the point of conception. Uh, Professor Jaime Gordon from the uh, prestigious uh, Mayo Clinic, he said, by all the criteria of modern molecular biology, life is present from the moment of conception. And then one last uh, person, he said, Dr. Watson, doc, excuse me, Dr. Watson Bose from the University of Colorado Medical School, he said, the beginning of a single human life is from a biological point of view, a simple and straightforward matter. The beginning is conception. So you, you have this, this constant unfolding. Now, um, anybody who's listening or anybody um, who listens later I, I could sense the rebuttal being, well, you just hand selected some scientists who, you know, presented your perspective or pre who presented your side or, you know, this is, um, you're being very selective in this. Actually, I'm not. And I could give a list of tons of others from this. Um, it was, it was like a congressional meeting. There were tons of voices that all said the same things. In fact, um, this is what's really interesting. There's a guy named Steve Jacobs, and he did his PhD dissertation concerning just general issues around um, abortion and uh, pro-choice and, and all that. Well, he decided that he was going to interview and gain data from the largest group of, of uh, scientists in America that he possibly could. It literally got direct information from thousands, um, literally thousands of scientists, um, and they may not have just been in America, but thousands of scientists on this issue um, of, of bi from biologists specifically asking, at what point does life begin? 5,577 of them, or 96% of the, the numbers that were surveyed, 96% of the professional working biologists who he interviewed stated life begins at conception. And he made the point that these were not particularly pro-life or pro-choice persons. The majority of them were pro-choice, which I, I can't even wrap my head around. But listen to this. He also surveyed um, the United States and found that in the pro-choice, uh, pro-life debate, 93% of Americans, uh, he said, most Americans, which is 93%, believe a human life is worthy of legal protection once it begins. Okay. You have to stop and consider those numbers for a second. 96%, the, the overwhelming uh, number of studied, working, professional biologists agree life begins at conception. And 93% of Americans believe that life should be protected at the moment where it begins. If the, if the broad sweeping percentage of Americans believe that it should start at the moment of conception, or excuse me, believe that life sh uh, should be protected at the moment where it begins, and if the vast majority of scientists 
understand through observation and study that life does begin at the moment of conception, then why is it that this is even a debate? Something is, is amiss here. And what I hope to bring out in just a second is my understanding of what's going on. Now, this is, a, this is an issue that I engage in a lot. It's something that I'm passionate about. Today in 2020, if you want to talk about true fundamental social justice issues, there is not a more fundamental discussion to be had. If, it's our, if, if we are sincere in our desires to bring about social justice in the United States, as so many are marching and protesting to have, if social justice is truly the thing that we want, then abortion needs to be at the center of it. Um, first of all, because it is, it is the destruction of a life that, that is given absolutely no say in the matter. And, uh, assuredly the life would not go along with it. So it's that, but also even specifically from a racial standpoint, if, if persons are willing to to suggest and to contend and to state that past laws in the United States, which were specifically um, uh, racist in their nature, even even laws that have been overturned, if if they're willing to say that though the law itself has been overturned, the the fruit of that law and sort of the you know the odds against a certain group of people is still in effect today because the law at one time was there and so we need to do more to kind of overcome whatever the situation is when it comes to the issue of Roe versus Wade and um, the biggest proponent of it in U.S. history Margaret Sanger she was a legitimate outright vocal racist who had uh, sort of a eugenics perspective on controlling population of black America. This is what Margaret Sanger in Planned Parenthood and what its founding is all about, which is astounding that this is not something that's being brought out right now. Why is that not being talked about? Why of all the social justice issues, when we're willing to search and sift through data to try and come to some reasoning, why is that something that's not being said? Well, one of the reasons is because the, um, the left ideology is not concerned with being reasonable in this area. And here's why I say that. I have engaged in a number of informal debates in this uh on this issue on on the issue of abortion pro choice pro life and uh, and all of that from both bible standpoint and the science standpoint this these are two there are two fallacies that are introduced from the pro choice side and they're consistently um brought into the discussion consistently in fact anytime you bring up any of the information i've brought before this these two things are brought out and usually the subject is then derailed and and it doesn't really go any further but i want to point out two fundamentally fallacious points of reasoning that are offered from the pro choice perspective that the idea of a fallacy is that it is not good reasoning it is not two plus two equals four kind of reasoning. It is not logical. It would not hold up in a court of law. It, it is, if you look at it on paper, it doesn't stick to the rules of logic. That's what a fallacy is. And these are fundamental points that are made from the pro-choice side. And so I understand, I've, I, I, to be honest, I don't think I've ever convinced anybody that is on the pro-choice side to come over to the pro-life side. Um, not that I won't continue to try to do so, but more so for those who are somewhere in the middle and skeptical and being confused by the other side. That's what I would like to, the persons I would like to bring in a little closer. And usually persons who are um, totally pro-life are never going to go over to the pro-choice side. You don't, you don't see that happening. Um, but the first one is the pro-choice red herring. Um, this is a logical fallacy wherein there's an issue that's being debated and the opposing side comes in and they they 
sidestep the issue by presenting material that at best is tangential to the discussion, material that is not the actual debated issue, but that is related in a close enough way that the average person who's looking at it uh, might be confused or derailed in the in the subject. Here's how it goes. You present this the ethical... So by the way, let me just state outright, the, the real question, the ethical question is, is it moral or ethical or right? Should it be lawful for one person to, to destroy uh, an unborn life? Is it ethical to take a human life, which biologists all agree it is a human life, is it ethical or right or moral to destroy a human life? That is, that is the basic fundamental question. That question is never going to be answered because if somebody says, no, it isn't ethical, then they have a really big issue with, with this thing. Or if they say, yes, it is ethical, then they have an even bigger issue because if they say that it is ethical to destroy a human life, then where does that stop? So they know they can't answer either yes or no on the issue. So they will present a red herring, and it goes like this. If you really cared about life, and if you really cared about limiting abortions and all of that, you'd be advocating for impoverished women signing up to foster. You'd be signing up to adopt. You'd be supporting comprehensive sex education. You would be supporting governmental initiatives to provide free birth control to all these women. And then they kind of step back, and there's, an, there's a big applause from the side who's in agreement with them it still doesn't answer the question. It's tangential information. It does not answer the question, is it acceptable morally to terminate a life? That's where the burden of proof has to, uh, has to be presented from the side who's saying that it should be okay. So if you really cared, you would uh, you'd do this. And now this is tangential. This is not the actual issue, but this point was actually made to me um, in an informal way on a, in a dialogue just recently, um, you would be, uh, y- you know, um, if Christians really care about pro-life, they will be fostering and adopting and all that. So I, w- so anyways, b- besides the fact that it was, and I didn't answer the response because I thought, um, well, actually what I did, I, I called the person back to the original discussion. I said, no, here's the actual question. The other stuff is, is just a tangent. Here's the discussion. But anyways, um, I, just for my own information, I went and actually researched that. The vast majority of foster parents and adoptive parents in the United States of America are Christians. The vast majority. So the persons who are wanting to take babies who've been, or even young children who've been rejected by their biological parents, the ones who overwhelmingly are responding to that need and wanting to bring them into their house are Christian people, which shows Christians are motivated to live out the command, love thy neighbor as thyself. And it also, it destroys the rationale of a person who's saying we don't really care about pro, pro, pro-life because we're not you know, we're not, we're not caring about these other things that are so important. I thought that was interesting. And I also researched this, the cost of an abortion is, it's unbelievably insignificant. In fact, there are programs and uh, ways to have abortions for absolutely nothing, next to nothing. Just go in and just get it done. The cost to adopt a kid is literally thousands and thousands. I want to say somewhere $25,000, $30,000 to adopt a kid. So you can have an abortion almost for free and it's multiple thousands. And there are Christians on huge lists wanting to adopt these babies. So if you want to talk about how we solve this issue, why is it that we're punishing adoptive parents and we're rewarding mothers who would wish to abort the baby? These are huge social issues that I do not think are being answered honestly. and. I am going to continue to be bold on this issue because it isn't right. Abortion is not right. And Christians need to be standing up for that. The Christian voice needs to be louder than the voice that would say that these children can go off and be destroyed in a little doctor's office where we can't hear their cries or feel the pain that they're feeling, which is another thing. They do feel a tremendous amount of pain. First, uh, fallacy is the red herring fallacy. The second one is 
um, the pro-choice straw man, and it goes like this. All you Christians want to do is control women's bodies. And I would imagine that you've heard this. I've heard it more times than, uh, than I can recall. It's incredibly common, and that's, um, that's why it is pinned as a women's rights issue. Um, and it's, it's presented so, you know, this is a straw man, by the way, because the pro-life position is not arguing that we wish to control women's bodies. You know, for, for any other reason, they can do whatever they want with their bodies. Um, we would be, if it was a, if it was a, a desire to control a woman's body, there'd be a whole lot more things we'd be trying to control, but that's, that isn't the concern. It is not a desire to control women's bodies. You will never hear a pro-life person pin it that way. In fact, every time it is pinned as, no, this is a human rights issue. It's not, it's not a women's rights issue. It is a human rights issue because both biblically and scientifically, we understand that there is a human inside of that woman from the point of conception. We understand that to be true. We know that to be true. So my concern isn't at all in how a woman treats her body. No one's trying to control that. The concern is for the little, tiny, invisible person inside of her who literally has no voice. There's nobody advocating for that person, which, by the way, is who I'm advocating for tonight. I'm advocating for that little baby inside her tummy. And you need to be advocating for that little baby too. And I'll say this also, it's more than just the women's, the woman's body. There's the autonomous person in her. That's the one that's being concerned about. But there's another voice that's left out of this altogether, and that's the father. I've seen and read way too many stories about fathers who did not desire for their girlfriend or wife or, um, or even just a, a one-night stand person that they you know, slept with. They didn't want that person to have an abortion. The father has no say, even though the person on the inside of the mother is 50% literally his DNA. There's a lot of voices that are being left out of this. So when you present the issue, the encouragement tonight is uh, for the pro-life person, do not be derailed by either the pro-choice red herring or the pro-choice straw man. Neither one of them are, are logical. Neither one of them hold up in a, a court of law. And the burden of proof is on the person who is advocating for the destruction of the child. And it has to keep coming back to the question, is it moral? Is it right? Is it ethical to terminate, to kill a human being? That is the question. And that's the question. If there's any response here, that's the question that needs to be responded to. Is it moral to terminate an unborn human being? And the answer is clearly no. That is not a woman's right to do that. She has a number of rights, but destroying the little baby inside her is not one of them.